Uh, one with the address, the emergency. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, I'm sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, I've been on the ground and there's blood everywhere. <laughs> on June 8, 2017, Montgomery County Police received a frantic 911 call from Lindley Rennick. She told officers that she had just found her husband of three years, 29-year-old Ben Rennick, unresponsive at their snake breeding facility. According to Lindley, she had gone to look for Ben after the school called to say he hadn't picked up their children. After getting the kids herself, she drove to their snake breeding facility sure that there was a logical reason he hadn't picked them up. Telling the children to wait in the car, she went inside looking for Ben. That's when she discovered his body lying in a pool of blood. Before dialing 911, Lindley had actually already called Ben's brother Sam to tell him what had happened. Sam arrived at the facility first and immediately checked on his brother. This phone call to emergency services paints a picture of what he found. Hello? Yes. Okay, we've got everybody on the way. Do you know what happened? No. It had a little shake. Lindley, I don't know where the stink is. Oh my god. Okay, tell me exactly tell me exactly what you see. What's going on there? Oh my god. My brother's dead. Okay, so he's not breathing at all? No, he's cold. He's blue. Okay, and it's it's not obvious what happened? Like you're not sure no. what happened? Oh, it's a heavy, heavy snake. I don't, I don't, oh my god, my brother's dead. My brother's dead. Oh my god. Okay, does it look like he's been shot? Yeah, maybe. No. You, just, you don't know? Do you know where the blood is coming from? Head, head. His head? Head. Oh my god. Police arrived at the scene within minutes, shotguns drawn and ready to confront what they believed was a deadly snake on the loose. As they approached the facility, they were confronting two terrifying possibilities. Either a massive anaconda was somewhere in the building with Ben's body, or whatever snake had attacked him had already escaped into the surrounding area. What they found instead would lead them down a much darker path. Oh, pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm not good with that. I'm not scared of snakes, but I'm scared of this one. I know when. What police found inside the facility was Ben Rennick, lying face down on the floor, surrounded by a massive pool of blood. With their weapons raised, officers methodically searched the building, checking each container and corner for any loose reptiles. Oh, so they're a shop. I'm sure there are. He's behind those bins and whatnot. Do we have anybody we could call to deal with an anaconda? I'm gonna kill it. We see it. Good. Good. I prefer it that way. Do we see where was where was the victim found? Exactly. Is there a blood trail leading to him? Is there anything? There's nothing that Anything to indicate where you would think as much for there, fellas, you, something got him. Paramedic said there's a bite mark on him. So if there's a snake loose in here. Mm -hmm. So watch your ass. After confirming every snake was securely contained in their enclosures, investigators could finally take a closer look at the scene. That's when the coroner noticed something on a shelf above Ben's body, a shell casing from a bullet. A closer examination revealed the horrifying truth. 
Ben Rennick had been shot eight times. Seven shots were to his back, with a final shot fired at close range to his head. What had first appeared to be a tragic accident was now clearly a cold-blooded murder. Police moved quickly to secure the scene and collect evidence, but despite their best efforts they were left with very little to go on. Apart from the shell casings found near Ben's body, there was no murder weapon, no signs of forced entry, and no witnesses. The nearest neighbor lived half a mile away. The rural location of the snake facility meant no surveillance cameras had captured any suspicious activity. Hoping to shed more light on what happened that day, investigators asked Lindley to come in for an interview. As Ben's wife, they hoped she might be able to provide some insight into who would want to harm her husband. I already talked to uh, a handful of other people a day about how your day went. But if you want to pull ahead and walk us through it. During her interview, Lindley painted a picture of what seemed to be an ideal life. She and Ben had been married for three years, building both a family and their businesses together. While Ben had made a name for himself in the reptile world with his snake breeding facility, Lindley ran her own day spa in Colombia. They were raising two children, Lindley's son from a previous relationship, whom Ben had embraced as his own, and their young daughter together. But when investigators asked if anyone might have wanted to harm Ben, Lindley's response took them by surprise. She pointed to Ben's own brother, Sam. She went on to explain that tensions had been brewing between the brothers over their inheritance. After their father's death, Ben had inherited the family's 72-acre property, while Sam received the money. According to Lindley, Sam had become increasingly resentful, even demanding half of Ben's land. Things had gotten so heated that Sam's wife had sent angry text messages to Ben, calling him greedy. Have you developed any kind of a theory as to what you think happened? I got the way earlier with it. With Lindley's suspicions pointing directly at Sam, investigators brought him in for questioning. While Sam admitted there had been tension with his brother over the family property and their personalities had grown apart over the years, he adamantly denied any involvement in Ben's death. More importantly, Sam had an airtight alibi. He had been at work at the time of the murder, which multiple witnesses could verify. He even volunteered to take a polygraph test, which he passed. Sam also fully cooperated with investigators, giving them access to his phone records, DNA samples, and anything else they requested. With their only suspect cleared, investigators called Lindley back in for further questioning. There had to be something, or someone, they were missing. As investigators continued their interviews with Lindley, the tone shifted. Gone were the gentle questions about her relationship with Ben. Now, detectives pressed harder, and as they did, they began to see a very different side of the grieving widow. Under the weight of their questioning, Lindley's carefully maintained composure began to crack, revealing a secret she could no longer keep hidden. If there is uh, another relationship, we need to know about it. So, I mean, it's obvious if you want, or if you have a relationship. Eric, he's my marketing rep. What started as a confession about one affair with Eric soon unraveled into something much larger. Police discovered that Lindley had been involved with multiple men during her marriage to Ben. Suddenly, the picture-perfect relationship she had described in her first interview was crumbling. But it wasn't just Lindley's infidelity that raised red flags. While Ben's snake-breeding business was thriving, Lindley's day spa was drowning in debt. She had failed to pay contractors, defaulted on loans, and was being sued by multiple creditors. She had even been secretly withdrawing funds from Ben's successful snake breeding business to keep her spa afloat, pouring thousands of dollars into what was becoming a financial black hole. Then investigators learned something else troubling. Within 24 hours of Ben's death, Lindley had already contacted his life insurance company about his million-dollar policy. The grieving widow was starting to look more and more like a suspect. Ben had no idea how in debt you were. He had no clue. He did not know that you were 15 to 20 thousand dollars minor. Some will say that Lindley was cold-hearted and she needed some money, and she saw that as an opportunity to get some life insurance. We know you were involved. Despite mounting suspicions, police struggled to build a solid case against Lindley. She maintained her innocence throughout multiple interviews, and while she had failed a polygraph test, these results weren't admissible in court. On paper, her alibi seemed strong. 
Cell phone records showed she was at her spa throughout the day, regularly using her phone and texting with various clients. There was also no physical evidence linking her to the crime scene, no murder weapon was ever found, and no witnesses had reported seeing anything suspicious around the facility at the time of Ben's death. With each passing month, investigators found themselves at a dead end. Despite their strong suspicions about Lindley, they simply didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. The case gradually slowed, and for two and a half years, Ben's murder threatened to become another cold case, joining countless others in the filing cabinet of unsolved crimes. Then, in January 2020, investigators finally got their first big break, one that would blow the case wide open. My information is out of the horse's mouth. And by the horse, you mean Lindley? Ever since I found this stuff out, it's been in my head every day. I think Ben was getting to the point where he was going to leave her. She was sucking money out of him for her business, and their just relationship didn't, wasn't going well. Her and Michael Humphrey, they drove to the farm. She walks in with the gun, and she just shoots him a bunch of times and leaves. Michael kept the gun, supposedly to dispose of. The ex-boyfriend in question was Brandon Blackwell. According to Brandon, Lindley had confessed to him that she and Michael Humphrey were both involved in the murder. Michael was a former client at her spa and someone she had been romantically involved with before her marriage to Ben. She revealed that her spa had been failing badly, and she had been secretly taking money from Ben's business. When Ben discovered this, she became terrified he would leave her and take the children. Rather than face divorce, Lindley devised a darker solution. With a million-dollar life insurance policy on Ben's life, she decided that murder was her way out of both her failing marriage and mounting debt. With this new information, police began taking a closer look at the people in Lindley's life. When confronted, Michael Humphrey eventually confessed. He admitted that Lindley had manipulated him into helping her, claiming Ben was abusive and that she needed his help to escape the marriage. Humphrey even led police to the murder weapon, which he had hidden in his girlfriend's mother's attic. But perhaps the most damning evidence came from Ashley Shaw, the manager at Lindley's spa. Ashley would later admit that she had helped create Lindley's alibi by keeping both their phones at the spa, even sending text messages from Lindley's phone to make it appear she was still at work. Armed with this information, investigators paid Ashley a visit. I'll just cut to the chase. Yeah. You have been implicated in being a part of Ben's death. So it's basically you're either on Team Lindley or you're on Team Missouri, and Team Lindley's going to jail. Faced with the gravity of her situation, Ashley Shaw accepted a deal from prosecutors, receiving complete immunity in exchange for her testimony against Lindley and Humphrey. With the mounting evidence and witness testimonies, both Lindley Rennick and Michael Humphrey were arrested and charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. Michael Humphrey was the first to stand trial. Taking the stand in his own defense, he tried to distance himself from the murder, claiming he was merely present when Lindley carried out the killing. She had asked me to come up there to the spa to meet her. Um, I, I believe it was in the morning hours, eight, nine o'clock, something like that. Um, and, and then to go with her out there to her house. I just pulled up and she came right out. Like, I mean, you didn't walk her, she just shows and runs out. Right. When she comes out, how's she dressed? Um, a leg, like black leggings and a hoodie on. And when you say the hoodie is on, hoodie is on, is the, the, the head part of that actually obscuring her head or is it down around her neck? I, honestly, I don't remember being up, but I... That's okay. You yeah. Know, but that's what she was wearing? Yeah. Was she, did she have anything in her hands that you recall? Um, a bag, like a, like a purse bag. And did you see this gun that you previously left behind with her? Not at that time. Okay. And we got out, walked around to the front of the car, and um, just as we get to the front of the car, from from my right side, basically, um, sort of behind me, um, she walks up to me, and I feel something at my hip. I end up turning around and looking at it. It's the gun that I'd given her. Shoved it back at her and asked her basically what, what the hell she was doing. And, and while this is transpiring between the two of you, what happens or who, who approaches or comes out? Ben came out the door at the, the exact 
time all this was going down or hey, just as it was and is he do you know what he's doing or can you see um if i remember right he had like some some bag or box or something in his hand to throw away and and when you're you're doing this with her he's coming out tell us the next thing that is said or transpires between the now the three of you there so she walks around kind of circles behind me this way and ends up telling him that I'm, I'm there to look at snakes um and that she had known me from or since high school or something something to that effect that i was a friend from high school or something like that yeah tell us what happens after you get inside the building with ben and she's out there doing whatever he he goes over to a sink that's on uh, the left hand side of the walkway through there something washes his hands uh turns and then goes down the, the main walkway there um talking about all the different types of snakes they have i don't know nothing about snakes so um at the, at the time that he's walking down through there, he gets uh, towards basically the end of it there. She comes in the door, um, walks right on past me. I'm figuring she's gonna go down there and, and talk to her husband, let him know whatever's going on. Well, she goes by you and heads in, in the direction of Ben? Yeah. Okay, tell us what happens next. Um, so like I said, I was looking at um, a whole lot of snakes. Um, and then I heard a shot come out, um, which inside there was extremely loud. So I kind of ducked a little bit. I looked down through there and she was at the end of the um, corridor or whatever you want to call it, posed up like this with the gun. Uh, and so you hear one shot and react to that. Yeah. And then look down to where they're at. Right. And when you look down there, how is Ben positioned if you, if you can see him? I couldn't see him at that point. Where he was at? Yeah, I actually couldn't see him. So he, he at least wasn't standing upright. Right. Okay. You could see her though? Right. And you said she was, she was, if you could stand up and show how she was positioned. Something, something was kind of like this. Okay. And, th and then did you say you heard more shots? Um, as I turned and went out the door, um, I thought two to three more, and then another one or two after I was outside. You weren't counting though, were you? I was not. But you heard, would it be fair to say, you heard several more after that initial shot? Right. But you, you turned and ran out the door? Correct. Where did you go? To my car. Did you leave? Um, not immediately. I pulled the door open, and I'm looking back up there to kind of see what's going on. It was a few seconds. She comes out the door. I'm still standing there. She runs around to the uh, passenger side of the car and uh, starts screaming at me to, to, to drive, basically. After a week-long trial, the jury found Michael Humphrey guilty of first-degree murder. But with a possible sentence of life in prison without parole, Humphrey struck a deal with prosecutors. In exchange for testifying against Lindley Rennick and leading police to the murder weapon, his charge would be reduced to second-degree murder with a sentence of life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Next to stand trial was Lindley Rennick. The state's case against her seemed strong. Both her former boyfriend Michael Humphrey and her trusted employee Ashley Shaw testified that she was the mastermind behind Ben's murder. Yet Lindley remained defiant, maintaining her innocence throughout the proceedings. Then, in what would prove to be a crucial moment in the trial, she made the bold decision to take the stand in her own defense. Um, when you and Michael got out of the car, Ben was already exiting the facility, right? Yes. So he saw you guys right away? Yes. Uh, did you have a gun with you at that time? No. Were you aware that Michael had a gun with him? No. Had you seen it on the car ride there? No. Did you see it in his hands or anything at that time? No. Um, so when I was walking into the facility, um, Ben and Michael were um, drying their hands off and like walking towards the back. So like they had been at the sink washing their hands and then headed back towards the back baby section. Now when you saw Ben and Michael walking together back towards the baby section, could you tell if they were saying anything to each other? I wasn't paying attention. What were you thinking about or doing? I was just trying to figure out what to say to Ben and how to approach this topic now. 
And to be clear for the jury, why were you really there? To ask Ben for a divorce. You weren't going to kill Ben? No. You weren't there for Michael to kill Ben? No. What happened next? I walked into the, walked, you know, down the aisle and I walked up behind um, Michael. Ben was back around the corner and Michael was standing kind of the way that the aisles are set up. There's just a small space to um, walk through to get to where Ben was. So Michael was standing right there and I walked up right, right behind Michael. I'm sorry. And then Michael turned around and I saw a gun in his hands and then I heard shots ring out and I screamed and I ran outside. And then I heard more shots go off and everything just went numb. And I remember staring at the trees and then Michael running out of the facility and pushing me towards the car and telling me, we have to go and get in the car. We have to go now. You knew who the real killer was and you told the police, not Michael Humphrey, but they ought to investigate Sam, correct? Yes. Man, what kind of cold heart lies within you? Objection. Relevance and improper lawyer comment. If you're willing to lie to the police about such a vital matter, why should these jurors now believe you? I was lying to protect myself and I told a lot of really awful lies just to do that, but it's just too heavy and it's too much. And so much bad has come from trying to hide behind those lies. So I understand what the prosecutor's saying about all of the lies that I told, but all I can do now is just sit up here and tell the truth and at least I will have gotten it out and I won't have to carry it anymore. After her emotional testimony and tearful pleas of innocence, Lindley Rennick had clearly planted seeds of doubt in the jury's mind. Following 11 hours of deliberation, they seemed unable to definitively determine who had pulled the trigger that day. Instead of the life sentence she faced for first-degree murder, Lindley was found guilty of the lesser charge of second-degree murder and armed criminal action. The sentence she received would stun the community and Ben's family, a mere 16 years behind bars, broken down as 13 years for murder and three years for armed criminal action. Meanwhile, her co-conspirator Michael Humphrey received life in prison with the possibility of parole for his role in Ben's death. The judge, bound by law to follow the jury's sentencing recommendation, had some choice words for Lindley Rennick. Missouri law does not allow me to exceed the recommendation of the jury on punishment, okay? I've gotten a bunch of letters going, give her way more than that. I can't do it. You can't do that under Missouri law, okay? So I just want to make that clear. I know some people probably won't hear that, but I can't, okay? Mr. Hesseman kind of got into the heads of what the jury might have been thinking. I don't know what they were thinking. He doesn't really know what they were thinking. He's drawn his conclusions, and I've drawn mine. Somehow they got confused. In my view, taking you out of the equation, his brother would still be alive. I don't understand how you're going up there at one minute you want a divorce and to get Mr. Humphrey mad enough to kill, I don't know, it doesn't matter if he killed, you were the one that put him up to it. You're awful lucky, ma'am. You're going to get out in your 40s and my 40s weren't too bad. I just hope you don't kill again. That's it. The aftermath of Ben's murder has left deep scars that continue to affect his family. His brother Sam hasn't seen Ben's children since the funeral in 2017. In his victim impact statement, Sam revealed that Lindley had even refused to return Ben's ashes to his family. The 72-acre family property, 
which Ben and Sam's mother had wanted to keep in the family for generations, was sold by Lindley shortly after Ben's death. Sam and his family received just 30 days' notice to vacate their childhood home. But perhaps the most cruel twist in this tragic story involves the children. Immediately after Ben's murder, Lindley transferred custody of the children to her sister. She then told Ben's children that their uncle Sam was the one who had murdered their father, completely isolating them from their father's side of the family. The truth only came to light years later when Ben's stepson discovered his mother's involvement through a Google search. The children, who had already lost their father, now had to cope with not only the knowledge that their mother was responsible for his death, but that she had spent years lying to them about who killed their father.